We're just going to give it a moment and let everyone come in from the waiting room. Please make sure you're muted as you enter. Good afternoon. This is a hearing before the Boston Cannabis Board, the BCB. Today is August 10th, 2022. Today's hearing is being conducted pursuant to certain temporary amendments to the open meeting law. This is what allows us to meet virtually. This hearing is being recorded and will be posted to the City of Boston's website. Before I review some procedural matters, I will introduce Chairwoman Kathleen Joyce. Thank you, Jasmine. My name is Kathleen Joyce. I'm chair of the Boston Cannabis Board. And today I'm pleased to be joined by my fellow commissioners. We have Commissioner John Smith, Commissioner Lisa Holmes, Commissioner Darlene Lombos, and Commissioner Alejandra Sankian. Thank you, Chairwoman Joyce. And my name is Jasmine Wynn, and I am the Boston Cannabis Board Manager. We are also joined by Allison Quinn, who is the project manager for the BCB. I will begin by reading each item into the record. I will then ask who is present on behalf of the proposal before us. Each applicant will have 10 minutes each to present to the BCB, followed by questions from the board members. We will then take public testimony, beginning with elected officials or their representatives, followed by the general public. If you wish to testify, please sign up via the link that I will put in the chat. If you have already signed up, you do not have to do it again. Additionally, you may use the chat function to request to testify as well. Please wait until the matter in which you would like to speak about is called. Do not use the chat function to give testimony. It will not be considered. Please state your full name, address, and affiliation, if any. Testimony will be limited to two minutes, at which time you will be muted. Additional testimony may be submitted in writing to cannabisboard at boston.gov. The record will be kept open until Tuesday, August 16th at 5 p.m. The BCB does not give any more weight to spoken testimony, spoken testimony than it does written testimony. We will begin with our first item. The applicant is Herbal Power LLC. The proposed license premise is 329 Columbus Avenue, South End. The license type is a retail recreational cannabis dispensary. The proposed hours of operation are Monday through Saturday, 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. and Sunday, noon to 8 p.m. Um, this is an equity applicant. The date of initial application was filed January 29, 2022. The filing with Inspectional Services was February 9, 2022, and the community meeting was May 16, 2022. Before I begin with the presentation, I will ask Aaliyah Flores from OEOI to speak on behalf of the equity certification. Thank you, Jasmine. Good afternoon, everyone. Our office was able to certify Herbal Power LLC as an equity applicant through the documentation provided by the applicant. Desiree Franjul is the owner and, a, and the 51% beneficial interest holder of Herbal Power LLC, meeting the 51% ownership interest threshold set forth in the ordinance. Ms. Franjul meets the following criteria. She is a person who has been identified or certified by the CCC, the Cannabis Control Commission, as an economic empowerment applicant or social equity applicant, and is a resident of Boston for at least one of the last three years. Ms. Franjul was certified as a social equity applicant by the CCC in May 2020 and provided documentation, including utility bills and a signed lease agreement that verifies she has lived in the city of Boston since at least 2019. Secondly, Ms. Franjul is a person who is of Black, African American, Hispanic, Latino, Asian, or Indigenous descent. Ms. Franjul identifies as Latino and Black and provided her birth certificate with both of her parents being from the Dominican Republic. Lastly, Ms. Franjul is a person whose annual household income is at or below 100% of the area median income. Ms. Franjul provided her monthly unemployment statements for 2021 and also provided her federal tax return that verifies she is below the 100% area median income of Boston. Are there any questions about this certification? All right, thanks. Seeing none, um, who is present on behalf of the licensee? I am Desiree Frangel. I am Brian Chavez. I well. am Yomari Chavez. All right, so again, you will have 10 minutes to present. Um, you may share your screen and begin. Jasmine, would you please um, give Adam Braylard um, access to screen share? Uh, we should. 
Thank you, Jasmine, members of the board. Adam Braylard from Prince LaBelle is also on on behalf of the applicant. Okay. I'll be sharing my screen. Thank you, Adam. Are we all set? I think we are good to go. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. I think we're ready to go. Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you, Jasmine, Aliyah, Chairwoman, and fellow commissioners. My name is Desiree Frangel. I am the, uh, if we can move over to the next slide. My name is Desiree Frangel. I am the founder and majority owner of Herbal Power LLC. We are a majority social equity and Boston equity local company. I lived in the South Ends Villa Victoria for 21 years and currently reside in Roxbury for the past 13 years. My background in community organizing began at the age of 16 at Inquilinos Boricuas en Acción in the South Ends Villa Victoria, and my roots lie deep in, in the South End. Yamari? Thank you, Desiree. My name is Yamari Chavez. I'm a graduate of Harvard and Columbia. I am a seasoned HR professional with experience in recruitment, retention, employee and labor relations, performance management, talent analytics, and diversity and equity inclusion initiatives. Brian? Thank you, Yamari. Um, my name is Brian Chavez. As the board knows, I am the first Boston equity applicant to be approved and operational in the city of Boston. Thanks to the work done by this board, I am now in a position to put other equity applicants uh, to help them become operational, which is my role within Herbal Power. Back to you, Desiree. Thank you, Brian. Our proposed location, next slide, please. Our proposed location, 329 Columbus Ave, is a commercial zoning subdistrict. Based on community feedback, and I will apologize in advance, um, we did amend our hours from 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. and resubmitted the overview to the board um, this morning. There was an oversight in our submission. Monday through Friday is 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. and 12 to 8 p.m. on Sundays. Patrons will enter the establishment on Columbus Avenue all deliveries and transportation of monies will occur in the rear door access through the alleyway. Our store will have 1500 square feet of retail space as well as administrative space on the lower level. Within the retail space, there is about 400 square feet dedicated to queuing to minimize any lines um, from developing outside. We will also promote online ordering so customers can quickly pick up their order and we plan to operate this establishment as other boutique businesses do in the south end uh, later in the presentation we will discuss ample public transportation in the area yamari thank you desiree we are committed to diversity and inclusion both through providing professional development opportunities and a safe diverse and inclusive workplace for our employees and customers. Our goal is to have a workforce of 50% Black, Indigenous, or people of color, and 50% will identify as either women, LGBTQ+, disabled, or veterans. We will provide anti-racism and conscious inclusion training at least annually. Employees will receive opportunities for equitable career development coaching and counseling and career advancement opportunities within the company. We will offer free seminars that educate Boston residents about adult use cannabis, and 20% of our vendors, ancillary businesses, and other operational needs will meet the above diversity requirements as well. Next slide. In addition to our diversity hiring goals, we also aim for 75% of our workforce to be Boston residents and 10% be individuals with quarries. We anticipate hiring between 15 and 20 employees, a mix of full and part-time, and will comply with the city's living wage ordinance with a starting wage of $17 an hour, offering a full benefits package and annual merit and cost of living wage increases. We will work diligently to ensure our hiring and retention goals, programs, and measurements are reevaluated regularly for improvement. Job postings will be sent to diverse sources including but not limited to the Massachusetts LGBT Chamber of Commerce, the Black Career Network, the United Latino Job Bank, and Diversity Inc. 
Back to you, Desiree. Thank you, Yamari. As you can see from the floor plans, we are utilizing the ground floor level as well as the basement level. Patrons will enter through the main door on Columbus Avenue. After being ID'd, they will enter into the dedicated curing area in order to check in prior to entering the retail area. As you can see, we will use stations to facilitate orderly queuing. This is to reduce the need uh, for any patrons to be outside of the establishment and we will have four points of sale. The basement will be utilized for storage and monies as well as back of the house and administrative functions and there's no public access to the basement. The image on the lower right um, on your screen identifies the access to the alleyway from Dartmouth Street and the rear door, which will be used for delivery and pickup of monies. And in order to ensure our proposal will not negatively impact traffic and parking, we retained Fuss and O'Neill to conduct an analysis of the existing traffic conditions, available parking and availability of public transportation. One of the benefits of this site is the proximity to public transportation. And as you can see on this slide, the site is walking distance from multiple MBTA stations, bus stations, blue bike stations, and parking garages in the immediate area. The traffic analysis also concluded that would be no significant impact to the existing traffic conditions. From this use and the combination of public transportation and available parking would be sufficient for our patrons. Additionally, the analysis found that the proposed use would be no more impactful than the prior use as a restaurant and is actually less impactful than some of the commercial uses allowed at this at this site. We expect uh, many of our patrons and employees will come via foot and public transportation. And our engineer, Matt Skelly from Foss and O'Neill is here to answer any questions or provide more details during Q&A. Safety and security of both our patrons and the surrounding community are at the utmost respect, um, importance for Herbal Power. And we have engaged Wind Walker Group to ensure the security and operational operation plans not only meet, but exceed the requirements of the Cannabis Control Commission and the Boston Cannabis Board. Every patron will be required to sign a good neighbor agreement, also known as a customer pledge, stating that they will adhere to all of the rules of the Cannabis Control Commission and the Boston Cannabis Board and will not, among other things, loiter, litter, double park, or consume product in the vicinity of the store. Any customer in violation of that pledge will be banned from the store. And of course, if there's any illegality, uh, the same will immediately be reported to Boston Police Department. The store will be fully uh, cameraed inside and out, and there will be a dedicated security guard during all hours of our operation. The security guard will monitor both the interior and exterior of the store. Herbal Power is committed to engagement and we have focused on extensive outreach securing 250 signatures of support shown on this map from abutters and South End residents. In addition to the community impact meeting, we have held multiple private but abutters meeting, met with the civic and business associations multiple times and reached out personally to our abutters. We're ha we have received a letter of non-opposition from the Ellis Neighborhood Association and from the South End Business Alliance. And we have also received a letter of support from the South End Technology Center. We have also joined the board at Friends of Child Hassan Park, which is located directly across the street from the site. We are committed to working with these groups, our neighbors and stakeholders to become part of the community and ensure that we're a net positive. The South End Technology Center is a vital vital organization for the community and Herbal Power has committed to donating $5,000 annually plus grant writing and volunteer needs to ensure the Technology Center continues to offer technology literacy to South End residents. We have also met twice with Council President Ed Flynn and Representative Santiago, both who provided actionable feedback regarding our proposal. Yamari. Thanks, Desiree. The image on the left side of the slide shows the population density around the site. The image on the right shows the proximity of the site to other cannabis establishments approved by the Boston Cannabis Board. As you can see, there is no retail recreational dispensary in this area. The closest is actually in the Back Bay and serves that community. 
Next slide. And these maps demonstrate the density of liquor licenses, coffee shops, and parking garages in the area. As the board is aware, Boston must locate a minimum of 52 retail recreational dispensaries. This ward and precinct voted to legalize adult use cannabis. Given this fact, the population density, the density of other types of commercial establishments, and the lack of a retail dispensary in this area, we believe there is a public need for the dispensary at this location, which again, is in a community commercial zoning subdistrict. And with that, we wanna thank you for your time and we are happy to answer questions regarding our proposal. Thank you. We will now move to questions and comments from the board members, beginning with Chairwoman Joyce. Uh, thank you, Jasmine. Um, thank you for your presentation. One thing that stood out to me um, and I'm not as familiar with this area as some of the other commissioners are, but can you talk me through the traffic study? Um, what are you gonna do for um, deliveries? This is sort of a congested area. It's tight, it's narrow. Um, we're finding um, on the licensing side, a lot of issues with licensees in similar neighborhoods that have a um, high percentage of their sales are um, come from third-party um, pick up operators, Grubhub and stuff, stuff like that. Um, what, what are you gonna do to uh, not contribute to the traffic congestion in this neighborhood? The double parking, um, the quick stop running in, getting something and coming out. Yeah, so we do plan, thank you for the question, um, Commissioner Joyce. We do plan to include uh, the no double parking um, in our friendly neighbor agreement that every patron must sign. Additionally, we plan to um, train all of our staff and security guard uh, to monitor the area and ensure that you know there's no nuisance around double parking um, in this area. Um, and Matt, I think Matt Skelly's here and he can answer more questions regarding the traffic study. Before. Sure. Um, and okay. Go ahead. And also we will not be, um, we will not be offering delivery. Just wanted to add that. And so that should uh, reduce the congestion, but please Matt continue. Sure. Yeah. I was just going to say, as far as deliveries to the site, um, you know, the uh, operator is going to have full control over when those happen. Um, and, you know, in, in practice, uh, typically in congested areas, those uh, deliveries are able to be scheduled outside of the peak hours um, when, you, when you see the double parking being an issue. Um, and, and if you have any other specific questions about the, the traffic study, I'm happy to answer. Is this a full traffic study? Uh, yeah, this is the um, a very similar scope of work that we've performed on uh, a number of other dispensaries that have um, gone through this board in the city, um, very similar to uh, what we've done in other communities as well. And um, Chairwoman Joyce, if I may add, we were also going to be offering online queuing, which many restaurants in the nearby area um, actually already uh, use. And this is basically where uh, a patron would go online and you know write their name down. If there's a wait, they would be um, they would be given a time where they they're able to walk back into the store. Um, and this is also going to help mitigate um, lines or traffic um, in the area. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I reserve um, my right to come back and ask other questions after some of the public testimony, but thank you for um, providing more information about that. Commissioner Smith, do you have any questions? Hi, thanks, Jasmine. Um, Ms. Franchul, so I just want to be clear. I didn't see it written, but it was mentioned. So your starting wages is $17 an hour? Yes, and I well, um, Yomari would be a more appropriate person. She, Sorry, Yomari. Yeah, yeah thank yeah. you. 
Thank you for your question, Commissioner. Um, so the starting wage, you know, uh, would be at $17 an hour, but that wouldn't be across the board. It would obviously okay. depend on experience and the level of the role. Uh, we do want to comply with the city's living wage ordinance, as well as provide a living wage to our employees in addition to the full benefits package. So uh, the starting, it just starts at 17, but it that's not the only wage. I hope that answers your question. Do you have a kind of sense of what it would be to start um, at 17? Or... Yeah, I would I would um I would imagine that the the range would be between 17 and 22 dollars an hour and depending on experience. In terms of experience. Okay. Yeah. You mentioned I saw in terms of the supporting diversity, the goal is to work with businesses such as SEEE, -E, who are those? Can, can you break that down? So yeah, so um, there are many social equity, economic empowerment, um, and di uh, diversity um, companies out there. Um, and we plan to be able to hire them for our ancillary needs, um, our vendors or operational needs. And we want to be, you know, we want to be able to set a realistic goal. And so we set the goal at 20% to ensure that, you know, we're meeting, we're meeting that, that minimum. And you're thinking that 20, the 20% 20 is realistic. For now. Yeah. For now. I think, okay. you know, the cannabis industry is just always changing and, and we're hoping that there will be more uh, minority owned businesses in the cannabis um, industry as we move forward. So. Okay. Um, and just lastly, just looking at some of the letters in support and in opposition, there, there's a lot of mention of the, you know, thinking about mitigation about proximity to the family park across the street. Um, lots of mention about the narrow sidewalk and the potential for loitering issues because it's a cash business and all that. Can you talk a little bit about um, sort of your mitigation efforts in terms of that? Yeah, absolutely. So the Friends of Child Hassan Park is the park that is um, directly across the street from us. It is actually, you know, it's it's a family friendly park. It's not a children's park. There are benches and, um, you know, people normally sit there um, and read or have their lunch. Uh, we reached out to them very early in our process and we're lucky enough to join some of the meetings and be asked um to become board members and so now as board members you know we really want to work with other board members in the community to ensure that their concerns are not happening and so if we have to you know provide additional cameras that's something we're willing to do but you know we feel like being uh, uh being on the board uh will really help ensure that you know we we're doing the best that we can to 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 mitigate any concerns around people loitering or or smoking in in the park. So, in terms of security, are you willing to provide extra security and things like that? Or absolutely, actually, one of the things we spoke about um, at one of the first meetings that we attended with the um, board members of Friend Hotel, Friends of Child Hassan Park um, were that we can offer um, additional camera coverage to ensure that we're getting some coverage across the street in the park and, and to make sure that our patrons are not going across the street to to light up um, and then also you know our security guard will be trained um, to be able to identify if any of the, if any of this is going on um, in regards to the sidewalk, I believe that, you know, in the traffic study, the sidewalk was measured. And I think Matt Skelly um, has some information that would be helpful. Matt? Yeah, we measured the sidewalk at um, seven feet in width. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'd say, you know, typically you're looking for a five foot uh, minimum width for a sidewalk. So not, not substandard in any way. Um, so yeah, no, nothing really to remark on there. Thank you, appreciate your responses. Thank you. Commissioner Holmes, do you have any questions? I just one, um, Commissioner Smith kind of um, hinted to it. Um, in your presentation, you really only say you have one security guard who will be not only monitoring indoors, but outdoors, 
I'm, I'm hoping that was a mistake and you're going to have more than one because one person can't do both. Yeah, so in terms of um, the security guard, we will have a, a designated security guard at the front. And of course, if needed, we will add more um, security guards to the property. Uh, we really want to be uh, like a good neighbor and ensure that, you know, patrons are following the rules. And so, you know, with the, sec uh, with the camera coverage and security guard and additional security guards if needed, um, we should be able to ensure that our patrons are following the rules. So the company, um, Windwalker, that, um, can you tell me a little bit more about that? So we were um, actually lucky enough to uh, have Windwalker Group do our security plan um, through the Boston Equity Program. And um, yes, yeah, so we'll be working with them. They, you know, they, they put together a very comprehensive plan detailing how the cameras would cover, you know, access in the, in the alleyway, uh, rear access in front and, and in the front of the building as well. And so um, we're really happy to be working with them. And if, you know, if as we move forward, we, we see that, you know, additional measures as far as security need to be taken, then we'll absolutely take those. Okay. Um, can I reserve in case I have another question when we come back? Of course. Yeah. Okay, so thanks. If I could add one comment um, to Commissioner Holmes, to to, we will have at least one at minimum uh, uh, security guard. Um, so there's going to be easily two, another security guard, at least two, depending on like peak hours, peak days of the week, like a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, when there's a lot more activity. That's kind of what I was going with, yeah, because some days you'll need one and some days you might need four, depending on the, the flow of the patrons. Okay, thank you for that, Brian. Thank you, Commissioner Holmes. Commissioner Lombos? Yes, thank you, Jasmine. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. I have a question about, since there were uh, a number of letters for, um, for support and opposition, one I am curious about, and maybe Jasmine and uh, Chairwoman Joyce can also help me to see if this is appropriate. There was a mention in the Ellis South End support or non-opposition letter about a good neighbor agreement. Is that just a standard agreement or there were specific things in there? Would you be, uh, is it appropriate to ask what was in that good neighbor agreement? Yeah, it's all public record. So okay. we have a copy of it. Yeah, we have a copy of it. Um, oh, we do have a copy. Okay, I'm yeah. sorry. I must have missed it. Do you mind just sharing uh, some highlights of it if that's possible? I just had it opened, but if someone from the team wants to go through it, I just closed it. Um, I don't know. If okay. I can go through it. It's fine. Yeah. I don't have to take up time. No. I can. <laughs> no, it's, they agreed to like not sell single single joints. Right. Yeah. Um, I and, what else yeah. and to vol volunteer with um, the Ellis neighbor to, um, neighborhood association, you know, attending meetings and making sure that if there are any concerns or anyone, you know, is caught uh, breaking the, the customer pledge that we are responsive and and uh, take care of the issue right away. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. I'll take a look at it. And um, since we have a copy of it, I was just curious if it had anything uh, directly uh, addressing some of the traffic concerns, but I can, I'll take a look at it. And just to jump in, because we got a question in the chat, which I don't normally take in the middle of the, someone's presentation, but a good neighbor agreement is a private agreement between two parties that we're not a part of. However, if this board decides to vote and incorporate some of those conditions into the license, they become part of the license. So should the applicant um, violate something that becomes a conditional license, they are in violation of their license. But this is something we are, this is what the purpose of this hearing is for the commissioners to consider all of those things, but that's a private agreement um, that we don't enforce. But should some of, the, some of that agreement become part of the license, we would be able to. Great, thank you. I don't have any other questions. Thanks, Jasmine. Uh, Commissioner Sangian. Yes, thank you. I had a, a couple questions. Some of them were, were asked already. In terms of the traffic study, one of the um, highlighted parts was that there would be no significant um, increased traffic as opposed to what was there 
before, which was a restaurant. And I wonder how you can, can you just talk me that? Cause it just seems like a restaurant, you know, people go, they spend quite a bit of time. And so are you referencing foot tracker, foot traffic or um, what do you call it? Uh, Vehicle. Vehicular <laughs> traffic. Yeah. Vehicular traffic. Sure. Um, yeah, no, uh, good question. That is so when when we say um, that there's not going to be more traffic than the previous use, um, I'd say, you know, in this case, um, I would say it does, you know, roughly translate to both of those, both pedestrian and um, vehicle traffic, but specifically in the traffic study, we're talking about vehicle traffic and um, that there's kind of two pieces of it. One, um, we get these rates uh, from the Institute of Transportation Engineers who um, base uh, the, the number of trips that a land use is expected to generate based off of data that's been collected all over the country um, and is you know the, uh, the trusted um, resource to do these traffic studies in our industry. Um, that's so number one, a restaurant of that size, a dispensary of that size, they generate a very similar number of trips. Um, number two, when it comes to vehicular versus pedestrian traffic, um, this is uh, a, an area that we certainly would expect based on census data um, to be, uh, you know, a dispensary is going to be um, accessed largely uh, on foot, um, you know, so we applied the, the relevant um, uh, mode split census data percentages um, and uh, you know, come up with uh, a relatively no, low number of new trips in general, um, even even less so as compared to the restaurant. Okay, so including pedestrian traffic, you're saying there's less foot traffic. Yeah, it's gonna be, yeah, we'd say very similar to the restaurant, yep. Okay, um, so in terms of that, so whatever increase there there might be, I know, again, the, the sidewalk was a, was a significant, um, came up significantly within the opposition. Um, thank you for, for clarifying the, the space. Uh, I think that that's important. I do know that it's very residential right, right next to it. So um, I know you said that you would have online orders. Are you considering online orders only? And are you gonna have, um, is all your queuing gonna be online or so that you don't have any kind of um, line outside? Yeah, so as far as queuing, we're going to have the online queuing. And if people decide not to queue online and walk in, there will be a designated area within the store where they can queue. Um, okay. I'm sorry, I forgot what, what the other question was. Uh, oh, the, the side. Yeah, line. I know yeah. that a lot of other places in other very congested areas yeah. have, have implemented, you know, places that have a number of cannabis assumptions. I'm thinking Provincetown in particular. Yeah. Some of the places have really have implemented online only just because they're in certain hours or times yeah. of the year. It's just it's just too heavy. I think I think having online ordering only is something that we will definitely consider once we're up and running. Um, we're, you know, based on Brian's experience and my experience with dispensaries in Boston, we're really not seeing um, long lines or or people rushing into one single store. People are really um, just visiting their neighborhood, the their neighborhood dispensary or the dispensary closest to them. Um, I know having lived in the South End for 21 years is a very walkable neighborhood. And if you live on Tremont Street, you're definitely not going to move your car to mm -hmm. come into our store on Columbus because you will never find parking again. Yeah. And so we see that a lot in the South End. And as far as like sidewalks, there's actually you know, the, the, the South End is very unique in its sidewalks, right? You have these beautiful brick sidewalks. Some of them are very big and some of them are very narrow. And I would make the example of Appleton Street, which is actually within our 300 feet, is a very narrow sidewalk. Literally only one person can, can walk on the sidewalk. You can't even push a stroller. I would say that sidewalk is around four feet. So, you know, the South, there are certain streets and like Gray Street in the South End as well, that the sidewalks are very narrow. So, you know, our, the side Sidewalk in front of 329 Columbus Ave being seven feet really, you know, it's really normal. Uh, it's a good size sidewalk for it to be in the South End, I would say. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, actually, I know that area uh, really well. I used to go to a place on Appleton that I loved. It was just called yeah. Appleton, I don't remember. Yeah, um, it was a coffee shop, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I, I uh, Sorry, uh, Deirdre, Adam Braylar here. Um, and Commissioner, just a point of clarification. Um, we've worked with some applicants in, in Provincetown in, in the 
online only queuing did come up, but in our experience, um, it's it's actually both it's online and in person um, that our applicants have uh, have obtained the licenses that way. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and then just in terms of the no deliveries, in term in term not no deliveries obviously to your store, but no delivery operations coming from your store. Is that something you have written in the agreement or? It's not, it's actually not in the agreement. We're just, you know, like I said, this is so walkable that we just don't see the need to have a third party delivery pull up in front. I feel like when we talk about traffic in the city of Boston, it's definitely exasperated by, you know, Uber Eats and DoorDash drivers. And so we definitely don't want to add to that. We really want to just operate the store as a small uh, local boutique store, like all the other um, South End businesses. I don't know that it would appease any of the opposition, but I feel like because the congestion was such a huge issue that that might be something you want to bring in to the agreement. We're, we're open to dialogue. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Are there any other follow-up questions from any other commissioners? No. All right, so now we will begin with public testimony, beginning with elected officials or their representatives. Yes, Madam Chair, members of the board, Connor Newman with the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services. At this time, the Mayor's Office would like to defer to the board's judgment on this matter. Uh, some background information on the community process. Our office conducting a butters meeting, or community meeting, excuse me, on May 2022. Uh, over 130 residents attended that meeting, and there was a lot of discourse um, prior to that, the applicant had several uh, meeting, community meetings that they hosted themselves that were not affiliated with the city um, in attempts to uh, communicate and talk to residents about what their concerns may be. Uh, the applicant received a letter of non-opposition from the Ellis Neighborhood Association. Um, during the community meeting and, and since then, uh, we've received concerns from many abutters regarding uh, traffic and the impact of parking on that area. Uh, the board should have copies of those letters. Uh, and with that, we defer to the board. Thank you. Good afternoon, members, all the chair members of the board, Anna Calderon from Council President Flink's office. Please note Council President Flink sent a letter to the Cannabis Board today, not taking an official position on this proposal. He would like to recognize that this is an equity applicant and minority and black owned business who are residents of Boston. Council President Flynn has also heard from neighbors and community leaders about existing pedestrian safety issues in the area and concerns on exacerbating double parking and congestions on Columbus Avenue. Moreover, neighbors know their concerns regarding the narrow sidewalk and accessibility concerns to lines from outside. In addition, neighbors have called attention to safety concerns with pickup, drop off, or school buses in the area, as well as potential public consumption at Children Hassan Park. Councillor Flynn appreciates that the proponent has proactively reached out to neighbors and engaged in a true community process. Thank you. Madam Chair. Oh, no, go ahead, Julie. Madam Chair, members of the board, Julie Ryan from City Council Frank Baker's office. This location is not located in District 3, so we would like to defer to the District 2 counselor on this. However, this applicant is open and operating another location within District 3. They are a good operator, and we have not heard any complaints from residents or businesses around them. We would like to just go on record in support of their good character. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julie. Are there any other elected yep. officials or representatives? Madam, Madam Chair, members of the board, my name is Luigi from Representative Aaron Michaelowitz's office, and we are opposed to this project. Thank you. Thank Good you. afternoon, Madam Chair, commissioners of the board, Jack Stelly from Council Murphy's office, similar to Council Flynn's office. We'd like to defer judgment to the board. We understand the concern about the congestion in the area and the increased traffic. However, as Councilor Baker's office mentioned, they are active in D3 and they are a top notch operator. Thank you. Thank you. Any other elected officials or their representatives that would like to speak? Seeing none, next Allison will go through those who signed up via the chat 
please limit your testimony to two minutes and state your name and address when providing testimony. Good afternoon. Uh, the first person who has signed up to provide testimony for Herbal Power is Michael King. Michael, are you available? Yes, I am. Okay, proceed. Uh, yes, my name is Michael King. Um, I'm a resident of Four Yarmouth Street in the South End, a block away from uh, where this will be located, its proposed, proposed location. I'm the executive director of the South End Technology Center, which is also um, about the same distance away. Um, I'm also a member of the Tent City Corporation um, Board and the, uh, and the Tent City um, um, Housing Development. Uh, it's, uh, Tent City is not um, officially, uh, I'm, 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 I'm support, in support of verbal power. Um, Tent City um, is not, you know, an official, officially, uh, the board does not um, decided to, you know, and in, in, in become involved at this point, um, but um, most of them. Anyway, anyway, well, I won't say anything about that. So basically, I, I think that um, you know, I think that for a lot of the reasons that we have this um, designated um, um, situation as far as for you know the uh, economic development in this area, uh, and also I think to sort of um, Increase the representation of um, blacks and people of color with businesses and, and, and working in this area, I think also makes for mm -hmm. um, a more uh, but, um, equitable. Um, what happens? Everybody can hear me? Um, yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. Um, you know, just make, make, to make it a more sort of a more inviting area and neighborhood and community for you know all people i think mm -hmm. uh, i support this uh um, product as well as you know for economic development um, which we all know about some of the issues that we have in this area in, in, in the united states with regard to that so i just am really happy to see and, and would be happy to see this um this happen in, in our community Thank you, Mr. King. I appreciate your testimony. Uh, the next person who has signed up is Lily Ocasio. Ocasio. Um, Lily, are you available? Yes. Okay, please proceed. Hi, my name is Lily Ocasio. I'm a resident at 26A San Juan Street. Um, my family, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, my family has been in this community for generations. Uh, my great grandfather was a co-founder of the Villa Victoria, leading the outreach for emergency tenants council. Uh, Black Latinos have been uh, fighting to remain and be a part of the neighborhood. It's time that we start recognizing the diversity in the community and be inclusive to all. And that's it, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, the ne next person who has signed up is James Finney. Mr. Finney, are you here and available to speak? Yes, I am. Okay, please proceed. I am. Okay, thank you. James Finney at 53 Gray Street. I won't go on the record because I support um, this because it's social equity and a minority owned company. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your testimony. The next person who has signed up is William Lopez. William, are you available? Okay, not hearing a response, we can come back. Um, Michael Curtis, are you available? How about Mr. Todd Davis? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Uh, thank you, board members. I, uh, my name is Todd Davis, I live at 325 Columbus. I am perhaps the most direct rebutter to this property that there is. I share a party wall with them for the entire length of their business, as well as street level frontage and alley frontage. I've lived here for 31 years, and I've, so I've been through three restaurants and at least two other businesses on upper floors. I'd like to voice my full support of this proposal. 
and I would like to welcome them to the neighborhood. The proponents have continually reached out to abutters and the neighborhood to address every point of concern, including my, my concerns, which I've had a few, as well as every issue of manufactured outrage, except the one which is to withdraw their petition. I look forward to living next door to a business that is quiet, responsive to neighborhood concerns, and one that closes at 10 p.m. A business that will not contribute to the out of control rat problem in the back alley, only that's, that's only been made worse by having a vacant storefront at that, place, at that property. I look forward to li living next to a business that will no longer exhaust kitchen fumes or light meat smokers in the back alley that sets off the building smoke alarms all the time. I look forward to a vastly increased security measures plan, particularly in the back alley. But I would also like to quickly address a couple of issues that you will hear repeatedly as if making them true. You will hear that the sidewalk there is abnormally narrow. It is not. I have actually measured it and it is eight and one half feet from the edge of the building to the curbstone. It's nine feet if you include the curbstone itself. This property is also has no obstructions on the sidewalk, such as tree pits or mailboxes or construction scaffolding or newspaper boxes or cell phone towers or even street All right, lights. Mr. Todd, that is your two minutes. I'm going to okay, have to you and we're going to have to move on. You can still move to your testimony. Support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Reed Correa, are you available? How about Jose Bermudez? Uh, Maria Cotto? How about um, Malcolm McDonald? Yes, I am here. Okay, great. So my name is Malcolm McDonald. I live on Chandler Street. I can hit uh, 329 Columbus with a tennis ball from my front step. Um, you should have also received a letter of opposition from myself. I am one of nearly 200 close abutters who are opposing this, uh, this proposition uh, for a variety of reasons, all of which are in the letters that you have received, not the least of which is the traffic issues. This location sits right in front of a turning lane. Um, the very idea of, as an example of online ordering, you'll end up with people double parking in the turning lane to go in and pick up their online order. This has been addressed with the owners of this uh, establishment numerous times. And we keep hearing, well, what, we're gonna have a security guard, but that security guard is inside, not outside as one of the uh, board members is uh, correctly addressed in this presentation. There are other issues specifically relating to safety. Um, there are numerous parks in the area, including the one across the street. Um, the narrowness of the sidewalk, it's very interesting to hear all these different numbers being uh, given out. The traffic study person gave one number, Todd Davis gave another number. I think everybody has measured this. The one thing I can tell you is from Arlington Street to Mass Ave, this is the narrowest section of sidewalk in the entirety of Columbus Avenue, That from that entire stretch, Arlington to Mass Ave. Um, the, a couple of other points I wanna make here in addition to the, the congestion piece, um, we have heard in the public uh, meetings with the applicants, a number of sort of comments relating to complaints. And what we keep hearing is we will consider it. It's not in the agreement, but we will consider it, things along those lines. Uh, once an application is granted to this, uh, to this applicant, the we will consider goes right out the window and the good neighbor agreement has no teeth. So as I said, I'm one of nearly 200 close abutters as opposed to many that are uh, in support of this who don't live anywhere close to this location. Um, and we do not wanna see this move forward. There is a vacant storefront right around the corner in Back Bay Station that would be far more appropriate for this business where there would be no- Malcolm, that is your two minutes. Okay, the next person who signed up is Brian Chu. Mr. Chu, are you available? 
I am. Um, hi, I'm Brian Chu, and uh, I'm at 303 Columbus Avenue. Um, I, I wanted to just mention on the traffic study that, uh, that um, we do have findings from an independent third party uh, traffic study or engineering firm called Bay State Engineering, which, uh, as far as I know, does not have a franchise working for dispensaries. Um, and so they've looked at it and uh, their findings uh, underscore and corroborate many of the concerns that have been outlined to date, um, you know, which I think uh, City Council President Ed Flynn alluded to now as well, and also in his letter to the board. So happy to provide more detail uh, on those findings, as I think it underscores the very real nature of the concerns that are raised. Mr. Chu, I read your letter and you referenced that, but I never saw the Bayside Engineering Traffic Study. If you want to forward that to us for our consideration, we'll take a look at it. Sure, we can uh, come back to you in terms of uh, sharing those findings. Um, they are The report is actually still being completed, which is why we haven't actually forwarded the entire complete, uh, report, but I did forward you to the draft findings, um, a, a number of them, which I think are relevant here. Um, and the other thing I think I would just say is that, you know, we have nearly 200 uh, signatures on this petition. Um, that's part of a grassroots effort. We're not a company. We're not a corporation. We don't have employees. Um, none of us stand to gain financially from donations or in any way. What you're really saying is it's just a simple you know, word of mouth grassroots effort. Um, and what it says is that people really, really care. Um, we didn't solicit signatures by posting on South End Forum or on the web. Um, and in fact, people actually went out of their way to sign in many cases, walking all the way across the South End just to add their name to an old school physical sign up sheet, just the way people make an effort to go to the voting booth. So I think that's worth underscoring here in terms of the, uh, the, the, the depth of the concerns um, in terms of people that are very focused on obviously this neighborhood. Um, I'd also like to say that, you know, the opposition here is not to herbal power, it is to this particular location. As Malcolm mentioned, you know, a location around the corner in the Back Bay Station, you're probably not going to get anywhere near this level of opposition. So, you know, I think, um, uh, let me just close there because I think I'm getting close to time. Um, but, you are uh, out of time, you. Brian. That is your Thanks time. so much. Thank you. Mr. Felix uh, Ramos, are you available? Hi, I'm Felix Ramos. Can y'all hear me? Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Felix Ramos. I'm a resident at 419 Massachusetts Avenue. I've been a resident with uh, South Bend more than 25 years, and I support Urban Power. Thank you, and have a good day. Thank you. Um, Deborah Lawrence, are you available? I am, thank you. Hi, Deb Lawrence. I live at uh, 303 Columbus, just a few doors down from 329, the proposed location. I just want you to picture with me for a minute what it's like to, to live here. So you have a road where the, the first lane is a straight and left-hand turn lane. The middle lane is a bike lane and the third lane is a right turn only. This proposed location is right in that right-hand turn only lane. And the sidewalk, we can argue about how wide it is. What nobody has mentioned is that it's also twice a week, there's trash out on the sidewalk, lots of trash. Um, and sometimes it's zero five in the afternoon. There's also tree pits. So this morning, I'll just give you a vignette of my morning. This morning, I met a friend with his dog in front of the location. We were chatting for a few minutes and somebody had to walk by us. They had to go into that right turn only lane in order to, um, to get by us. I walked back by an hour later when I came home and once again, there was a huge semi truck parked with in that right hand only turn lane, making deliveries into um, the Cleary. So what happens? They, they take a hand truck off the, off the big truck and they go around the corner to the alley because this alley has no outlet. You can't get a truck into it. I don't know how they're gonna make deliveries into this alley. It's half an alley and it has like a dead end. You can't even get into it. Um, and so, you know, you have this terrible location for this. And we hear about this traffic study. This group's attorneys on one of our neighborhood meetings has offered twice to share the traffic study. I've made a written request for that to the attorney. I've heard nothing. Um, and the other thing is there's no parking. So it's all meter parking. There's no parking at all in front of this location. As I mentioned, it's the right hand only turn and it's residents only except, you know, there are meters during the day. But today, again, I looked around my street. There's not an empty meter. Hi, Deborah. That is your two minutes. You can submit the rest of your testimony in writing. Thank you. 
Hey, Amrit Kanwal, are you available to speak? How about David Ting? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir. I am David Ting. I live at 303 Columbus Avenue. And I am one of those 200 uh, residents who are opposed to the proposed dispensary. And uh, I think, you know, I, I, I am a long-term Democrat and voting resident of the city, trial supporter of Ed Flynn and Dr. Santiago, and of course, Michelle Wu. Uh, I support minority-owned businesses. I am personally a minority-owned businessman in Boston. And the point I'd like to make here is that Typically, you know, because I'm in real estate, and I've been in real estate for over 35 years, what happens is that reality is often very different than what these studies show. And I think Deborah Lawrence and Brian Chu and Malcolm McDonald and, and uh, you know, and the other 196 uh, uh, petitioners can share that with why we are in strong opposition. So I'd like to thank you for considering this, our, our, our thinking on this and, and that uh, we, we are against this proposal from going forward. Okay, thank you. Is uh, Cedric Hamilton available? <coughs> How about Susan Bassoni? Oh, I'm here. Sorry. <clears throat> um, good afternoon. Um, thank you for the opportunity to uh, voice my concerns about this proposed location. I too have sent letters to the cannabis board as well as to my elected officials. I've even met with several of my elected officials in person. Um, and um, I think I would highlight a lot of the points that were made. The traffic study that has been discussed that was done by Herbal Power um, is really unrealistic. There's been no mention of the three school buses that come along this way, both on Columbus and Dartmouth. Um, and when you're walking from 303 Columbus all the way around to 111 Dartmouth, that's where um, another resident cited all these trucks stop and unload and load constantly. Um, and um, she's correct. You cannot go into that back alley with any type of delivery truck whatsoever. But I guess one of the questions I wanted to raise were two. Um, one is that this decision where these locations are determined is based on a zoning district map that was approved by the Zoning Commission in 1998. If you go back to 1998, the block that we're talking about where herbal power wants to be located was completely blighted. That is not the case anymore. There are three large parking garages, several apartment bu buildings, a large um, residential building, a large uh, commercial office tower, all of which have brought a number of people, but also a number of cars. So that's one thing you need to consider why you're using a map that's so dated. Secondly, I has is it required to do a viability, excuse me, a viability study? Will this business be in business long enough or show you their projected revenues and expenses? Because when I do the math at $17 an hour. Susan, that is your two minutes. Thank you. Is Mr. Lewis Dow available? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Can you see me? Proceed. Hi, everyone. My name is Luis Dow. I am a direct abutter at 325 Columbus Avenue and one of the trustees of my association. I submitted a letter to you signed by 21 people from my building in strong opposition to the dispensary. That is all but one person from my association. We also have signatures from the people above where the business would be, the direct abutters on the other side of the building, people who live on the other side of the shared alley and large numbers of people on the same block, all in strong opposition. As we explain in the letter, we are not opposed to dispensaries in general or even in the neighborhood. And we are very supportive of minority owned businesses being minorities, many of us ourselves, 
but we simply believe this is not the appropriate location. Among other reasons, it is a busy intersection with no parking and a very narrow sidewalk. Any stopping or double parking in this open space, for example, by dispensary customers pulling up for a quick pickup or quick purchase would further intensify an already congested and hazardous intersection. The narrow sidewalk becomes even more narrow twice a week when people put their trash outside and even more when there are piles of snow during the winter plus trash that you get less than half the sidewalk by then, which is much less than the five feet that um, they mentioned in their study. We see this as very important safety issues and we really hope you consider them. In short, we are not opposed to dispensaries and are supportive of minority owned businesses. We simply believe this is not the right location. Most people who live close by will agree. A lot of the people who are in support live a lot further. They will not be directly affected by this. I respect them, but this, um, I hope that you consider the people who live right there, the direct abutters. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Mr. Dow. Is Jessica Vasquez available, please? Yes, I am. Okay, please proceed. Okay. My name is Jessica Vasquez. I live at 9A West Dedham Street. I lived in the South End for my whole life for 41 years. I just wanted to express my support for her herbal powers, and I believe the business will benefit the community and bring diversity to the South End. We need more minority owned businesses and I support this. Also talking about parking, it's all over South End. I've been living here 41 years and it's all over. We all have to deal with this. I live all, a little bit further down and I'm dealing with people from over there coming to take our parking space. So it's all over the place and the traffic is all over the place. That's it, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Is Mr. Michael Curtis available? Uh, yes, I'm here. Okay, please proceed. Yes, I'm a tenant at a 333, and I've been living here for 30 years. I'm also a concierge at a residence at Harcourt Street for 30 years. So this is my neighborhood. I'm the gentleman who sits on the stoop every morning at 7.30. Uh, there's always a parking problem. It's been this way for 30 years. They've committed to making sure that no one will park there, and they're gonna actually have a security guard outside. That's amazing, because it is blightful to the left of my building. And to have someone out there to keep an eye on what's going on would only be a benefit. I am for any type of equity in this neighborhood. And also, um, there's always gonna be problems with the sidewalk. We are in a the city, there's nothing new here. What's gonna be there? Maybe a bar that was there before. There's also staging out there. I would imagine one day that would be removed, but I just wanna be on record to say I'm for this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Curtis. Um, is Erica Scott Popolo available? Yes. Thank you. Please proceed. Hi, thank you, commissioners. My name is Erica Scott Popolo and I reside at 55 Devon Street and I wanted to be on record in support. I have known um, the applicants for over 20 years um, and can attest to their personal and professional commitment to the South End and to our city. I keep hearing people say that they support minority owned businesses. Well, the way that we show our support is by being in support of this proposal. Uh, they have done their homework. They have dotted their I's, crossed their T's, been extremely accessible to the community. And I'm fully confident going forward that they'll be a good neighbor, bring diversity. And um, this is really how we support equity by being in favor of these proposals. So thank you. Thank you. Is Anna Palka available? Yes, hello. Hi. Hi. Please proceed. Uh, I live at 325 Columbus Avenue. Um, and I would like to say that this particular location with this particular business uh, leaves a lot to desire, namely, and we've mentioned this, the sidewalks are super narrow. There's not really a way to deliver in the back alley. But really, when we consider, I think when it comes to businesses that come into our neighborhood, we have to consider synergies. How does this business coming in is going to work with what's already there? And you have Clary's and you have Brownstone, Brownstone next door to us. Clary's Let's be honest, it's open to the public. Uh, college kids come there and um, 
and party for part of the evenings, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Um, how will that affect um, having dispensary next door? There's simply, when it comes to the good neighbor agreement, it really truly has no teeth. Think about how many college students we have in the neighborhood. Think about how many, every single one of them can come and purchase. And the next week is going to be another friend. And we'll never, that as much as the proponents would love to make the good neighbor agreement work, it's very unlikely to. I worry about getting through that uh, narrow sidewalk. I take it with a stroller every day. I walk those streets. I really encourage every single person to show up when there is a high traffic, when there is plenty of people walking around. What does it look like? What does it feel like? There's trash everywhere for 24 hour period, twice a week. Parking, when it comes to parking, there's no parking. There's meter parking. And let's be honest, that street gets cleaned twice a week. So there is no parking. I appreciate that the hours of operation have been slightly adjusted, but it does not. Anna, that is your two minutes. Thank you. Is Cheryl Dickinson available? Yes, I am. Okay, please proceed. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I'm president of the new Ellen Rowan Craig Park, which is going to be operational in 2023. It's a larger, more secluded park site then Chowd Hassam. It's located at the corner of Columbus, West Canton, Appleton. That's we are only one block away from the dispensary. Now already this site is plagued with cannabis smoking. I dare not say to someone, please quit smoking because I don't know what kind of response I'm going to get. The park is situated where it services primarily minority populations, people of color. This park was designed to be able to service those people who for 40 years have not had any outside space. We want those people to be able to be comfortable and families to be able to use this park. This park has been five years in the making. There's ample publicity and there are signs on the site so that if someone were to go by, because this does abut, this is in the abutting area. If someone were to go by, they would see that there was an opportunity to be able to do something about the Crite Park site. Yet no one, no one has approached us for security. I do not anticipate that the security people would be coming one block down to take care of the overflow that may be dissipated if you have a security person in the immediate area. I have, I really don't believe that it's possible, physically possible with one person to be able to come and to secure that park. I cannot stand by and watch that park be turned into a site that becomes a comfortable place for people to smoke recreational cannabis. And the people who attend, they're not going to be the ones to discourage it. And at the same time, we don't wanna keep those people who we want to service away. So thank you for the opportunity to speak. I am opposed to this proposal. Okay, thank you. Is Mike Nelson available? Uh, yes, I'm here. Okay, um, please proceed. I, I just wanted to speak. I just wanted to speak in support of the project. Uh, I am a resident of the South End since 2010. I want to caveat that I am in the Wasana neighborhood and active in that, so kind of the opposite side of the neighborhood. Um, but in, in our, we we have uh, dispensaries on on Albany Street. I visited the other dispensaries in the city. Um, most of the ones that are close to the South End. And I just don't see the problems uh, that get pegged with these types of developments. Um, I wanna be pro-development. Uh, just today, uh, we had another business go, go out of business on Washington Street. Um, and I would rather live right next to a dispensary uh, than an ATM or a bank. Um, I think that this is a great use of um, uh, street level retail. Um, and I just, I see too often that we 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 see these projects and we use them to to peg the the the, the problems of society on them. And I think we should be pro development. We should be pro minority business. Um, I think we should welcome these types of business to the South End, and they provide tax revenue streams. Um, and you know, for the parking issues, I just you know, a week or two weeks after these things open, everything settles down and. I have not seen any traffic or parking issues from any of the dispensaries that are open in this neighborhood. 
And, you know, we have to remember it's a public street that we're storing your, your private vehicle on. Um, so please don't conflate the two issues. Um, we need full storefronts in the South End. We need active and engaged owners. And that's what I see here. So I, I, I hope that we can, as a community, embrace new business in our neighborhoods. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And with that, that concludes uh, the, everyone who signed up to provide uh, testimony me, on Allison, that. Wait, uh, wait, I, wait. I enforce it there. No, no, no. We're going to get to you, Brian. She's just saying those are all for those who signed up uh, uh, previously. You. Okay, we're going to move to those who have raised their hand. The first hand I see is Slim. Yes. Hello. My name is Darrell Weathers. Um, I'm just, I, I'm a storefront owner in, uh, in, in, in Boston. And only thing I can say is that um, once I, I see the community of South End and hear minority businesses, it seems like rich people protecting capitalism. Um, I'm just going to be honest. And I feel like that this business ensures the community. I feel like herbal power is community power with uh, ensuring the community jobs. And I believe that this is uh, amazing to um, come into the community. The fact that there's so many vacant buildings in Boston, the community of South Bank is to say, hey, go to another one. I feel like it's very distasteful when certain parts of the community is $8 per household sale in Boston and um, capitalism is rampant. And this, um, I just think this is amazing. Starting at $17 per hour is a great um, way to ensure the community as well. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Brian. Hi, I'm Brian Forsyth. Uh, I am the landlord uh, for the units number two, number four, and number five within 329 Columbus. So I would, I would say that I have the most uh, concern of, of, uh, of any of the, um, as much as anybody else on the call. My primary concerns lie with access. The basement of uh, 329, if it were to be leased to herbal power, would not be accessible to any of the tenants. The gas, the water, the electricity, and the sewer all run through the basement. And since cannabis is a controlled substance, none of the tenants will be provided access, which will put all of us at risk uh, in the event that any of these utilities go out. We will not have access. Uh, the comparisons furthermore to the restaurant, I believe are specious. Uh, a restaurant, uh, when you go to a restaurant, you sit for 60 or 90 minutes. So when you go to a cannabis store, you go for five minutes. So it defies common sense that the traffic study, which has been put forth, actual coincides, actually coincides with what we might realistically uh, expect uh, with respect to flow. The other concern I have is with the smell. Uh, cannabis, although it's being stored in sealed containers, all the dispensaries I've visited have pungent smell because of the terpenes. It makes many, piece, uh, many people nauseous. It's skunk-like. Uh, I fear that if I still live there, I would have to move out as my uh, tenants may have to as well. So in summary, I'm vehemently against this project. It's a threat to health, uh, property and even life in, uh, in the event of an untoward uh, event with the utilities. Uh, it, this is just not the right place for a dispensary. I have nothing against uh, cannabis dispensaries in general, but it would be hard to pick a worse location uh, in my opinion. So I hope that uh, the board takes all of these uh, comments uh, to heart uh, because I truly want what's best for the neighborhood. And I don't believe that uh, a cannabis uh, shop in this location serves us well. So uh, thank you again, uh, and I hope that you make the right decision here. Thank you, Brian. Um, next is Sherry White. Sherry, do you have your hand raised? I'm sorry, I was muted. Oh. Can you hear me okay now? Yeah. Okay. Hi, um, I'm I'm a lifelong resident of the um, of the South End, and um, uh, I say the South End. This neighborhood has far bigger issues than a narrow sidewalk. Um, I'm very much in support of uh, minority businesses. I'd love to see more Black and Brown businesses in the South End. Um, I think that, um, or I should say, I know that black and brown businesses will definitely help residents to become clear and comfortable that black and brown businesses are neither undesirable nor do they attract undesirables. And I am in full support of the application. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sherry. 
Is there anyone else that did not get a chance to speak that would like to speak on this proposal? Seeing no one, do any of the commissioners have any follow-up questions? I do, Jess. Oh, Commissioner yes. again. Yep. Um, I just there. I heard conflicting accounts of how um, the the product about the product delivery um, being behind the the building. So, uh, if someone from uh, uh, Herbal Power could kind of walk me walk me through that again, because it seems from the resident's testimony that there wouldn't be, you wouldn't be able to deliver in the back. And I um, just, either you can or you can't. So I just wanted to can, see I, I, Can I speak on that? Yes, Brenda. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, Commissioner Guillen. That was a great question. The alley that's in the rear is gonna be our designated area where we will receive the deliveries. And our experience at where I'm operating at 43, 44 Street, well, we get deliveries, we don't use big trucks or 18 wheelers like Clary's, the Urban Grape or the Brownstone. That alley is accessible with a small van or car, but it is not accessible with an 18 wheeler truck, which I think was trying to be communicated. So um, our Windwalker security plan uh, will show that the rear is our designated delivery area and it is accessible by car or van. Okay. Um and, and I'm sorry, someone else wanted. Um, and then the question of security, I thought I heard that a security would be outside, but then in testimony, I heard there would only be security inside. Can you verify? We want to say that there's going to be at least one security at the minimum uh, throughout the week to monitor inside and outside, obviously days of like Thursday, Friday, Saturday, when it, like peak hours and peak days of the week, mm -hmm. we have no problem with uh, staffing accordingly with maybe two people, one person to look the interior and another person to monitor the exterior. But the, the, the current plan is have one be in both? No, one at minimum. One at minimum. One at minimum that could kind of But I'm sorry, that would flow in, in back from in and out? In and out, you know, like yeah. a Monday or Tuesday probably doesn't have the same level of traffic as a Friday or Saturday where mm -hmm. you know at Freeport Street sometimes we have two lot attendants one of somebody look monitoring outside and somebody inside to mm -hmm. um, that's the case who checks IDs if you only have one security who's who's floating from inside and outside who checks IDs no so the the security at the front entrance will check the IDs in the event that um, it is slow and they are able to come to the door, they will be able to see um, if people are double parking or be able to, you know, to see what's going on outside. Additionally, the cameras that we will have will allow access to view what's going on outside um, to our security guards. We did agree with the Ellis Neighborhood Association that we would have extra security upon opening. And, and that's something that we will have. And moving forward, we will adjust. If, if, if there comes a point where we need to have three uh, security guards, we will make sure we have three security guards. But for, for now, what we, um, what, we plan, what we plan on having is one to two security guards at the front checking IDs that will also be able to monitor the back cameras and the back alleys physically. Can you describe the, the staffing? Because I'm just confused how you can have one person monitoring cameras, another person, but that person also is responsible for the front door and then who does IDs? I just need a better understanding of the staffing model Absolutely. on the floor and in the back and how this happens. Yeah, if you want, we can provide something in more detail, but our plan is to have someone in the front that will check IDs. At the station in the queuing area, there will be you know a small screen showing the cameras indoor and out, inside and outside. And that's um, monitored by who? By the security guard that's checking IDs. So, May I step in, Desiree? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So the staffing mo the staffing plan to answer your question, Commissioner Joyce, will involve the security guard is uh, going to be um, checking IDs of people who come in, but there will be staff inside who will be trained to also check IDs and also request backup ID if necessary. The cameras, um, you know, the idea of having a 
a list of uh, or video of cameras on the inside is still under discussion because it all depends on whether we'll be able to accommodate that in this queuing space as well. But that why that's why we have the security guard sort of like at the entrance monitoring the inside and the outside. However, as you know, we have an administrative space downstairs where there will be additional like management staff like myself who will also be able to monitor the the cameras as well and the cameras are also going to be uh, accessible to Boston police through a live feed so I hope that that answers the question about the cameras in terms of the staffing model going back to it security card a minimum of one staff inside will also be able to check IDs um, going back to what Brian said about um, volume in the event that there's not a lot of volume, there's not a lot of activity. The security staff may be asked to check IDs so that staff can take care of other activities in the back, such as monitoring inventory, you know, whatever back of the house items need to be taken care of. In the event when there is increased volume, and this is what we like about this location, we would utilize the queuing area. Additional staff would be pulled to check IDs, verify identification, um, and ident um, IDs are also going to be checked at the point of sale. So does that answer your question, Commissioner Joyce, around the staffing model? A little bit. I'd love to have it in writing. I'm also thinking like you testified earlier today that one of these um, staff members or security officers is also responsible for monitoring double park cars, looking at cameras, checking IDs. It just seems like a lot of responsibility on one person. These are, to me, these are quality of life issues for the neighborhood. And I just wanna see in writing how you plan to address them. And they're also public safety issues. So, you know, security we take seriously. I wanted to make sure you guys have thought that through, that's properly staffed. Um, I, I will look forward to seeing it in writing, but off the cuff, I would think you would need more, more security staff. Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. We'll definitely provide um, something in writing. And I think it's the, the way that we presented it was just um, a miscommunication, but we do um, have an outline plan that we can submit to the board right away. All right. Um, Commissioner Smith. Oh, sorry, Commissioner Sankey, do you have additional no. questions? Sorry. Yes, but then I was going to say Commissioner Smith has his hand raised, okay. up, and I didn't want to overstep you and say no. Oh, whoever. <laughs> yes, the question about the um, the utilities access uh, in terms of people in in the building is that is that um, can you kind of talk more about that? Yeah. So the the. The basement, um, there is a room in the basement with uh, the uh, access to the utilities. According to the master deed, this is not common area. So technically um, it would not be accessible to the public. However, we've reached out to um, uh, Mr. Forsyth's mother-in-law who manages the property, Katie Sluter, uh, numerous times via email to you know to have a discussion and to inform them that if at need, if needed that granted um, access to the basement will be granted to them you know i know that coda bar was there for 10 years and they worked very well and and you know allowed access to the basement when needed i don't think any emergencies ever arise where that was the case and 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 tenants from above had to come into the basement but we would we would offer um the same access to the basement in case of an emergency or or servicing of the utilities of course okay that's right how, how would that happen after hours since it's a controlled substance Hi, Brian, no one on site Brian, you already spoke Please submit any additional comments in writing. We, the commissioners are asking questions right now, so I appreciate it if you don't interrupt. Thank you. So Jasmine, I was gonna ask the same question as Commissioner Sink in. Thank you. Desiree already answered it. I appreciate that. Yeah. Any other questions from the commissioners? Okay, I do see additional hands raised. If you already spoke, you will not be called on again. I'm only gonna call on those who haven't spoke. Um, Jamel Trapp. I'm here. Hello, I'm here. Um, I'm the um the, I own the unit 329 Columbus Ave where, where this is where this um is proposed and um the 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 other landlord said something that's kind of not accurate. Um they don't have any right to my um to my basement. It's it's they get and it's no problem for them to get in there for, like with a schedule, you know, a, an appointment or whatnot. And um the alleyway is 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 everybody owns it that's adjacent to the building so 
it's not it's it's not a problem. It's a, a vans have big trucks can get in the alley, but it's just a hassle. So most of them just do the parking on the on the um on the sidewalk. But the van, the, the alleyway is no problem for vans to get into the alleyway, and nobody has any right to my biz, my building, you know, to to monitor meters, electric, and everything. And I have no problem letting them in, but it, it kind of seemed like that they made it seem like they have a, a right that it was seemed like it was a right to 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 access my property when it's not. It's it's um. I'm, you know, I just want to clear that up. I don't want, you know, I, that's all. I'm sorry for um, dragging on. So I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, Cedric Hamilton. Hi, I'm Cedric Hamilton. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah, I've lived in uh, the South End since 96. And I would actually love this dispensary to be in the area instead of me having to go to Grove Hall, Newton. Brookline, I actually would like a dispenser in my area, so I'm in full support of this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, seeing no additional new raised hands. Let me just scan, double try. Uh, Aliyah. Hello, my name's Alila Warmsley. I live at 354 Shamed Ave. I've lived here for 28 years and I want to um, voice my support for this proposal. I've listened to many of the abutters say that they have nothing against the proposed business, but NIMBY, not in my backyard or not in my front, front yard, you know. Um, I don't think it's right. I hope it's not a common occurrence for minority businesses like I believe it is. And also some someone mentioned earlier that they had people that came from locations further um, than the business uh, proposal business location that signed um, opposition, signed in opposition to this. And that, you know, like they, they didn't like go out looking for them. They just came, but then, and they welcomed it basically. Right. But when we say like, oh, I live on Shamit Ave and it's not close to that place, they don't take that as as like good contribution because like, oh, you don't live right next to it. So you're not the one who's going to be dealing with it. And I just don't, I don't, I don't think it's right. We all live in the South end and we all have our own, our own, um, sorry, I'm alluding the words, um, our own, um, thoughts and feelings on what we want in our community. And I, I want this, I support this and I hope we get to see them soon. Thank you. Thank you. I did see a George Swallow. Is George still on the call? Nope, not seeing them. Jasmine, can I make one clarification in regards to the community support? Sure. Um, so the, the signatures, we've gathered over 250 signatures. I personally walked around the neighborhood with a paper, a pen, and um, support forms and collected around 180 signatures. And then there were 80 signatures that were collected on the South End Community Forum on Facebook. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that, you know, I did not pay anyone, um, you know, as a long life south end resident i was able to walk around the neighborhood and really um receive feedback and and get signatures of support the good old-fashioned way so i appreciate your time all right thank you uh any other commissioners have any follow-up questions all right seeing none the board will take this matter under advisement we're going to take a quick five minute break we'll be back at 2 40. thank you all right, we're going to get started. Just want to make sure all my commissioners are here. Chairwoman Joyce, I see you. Commissioner St. Ian, I see you. Commissioner Holmes, Commissioner Longos, Commissioner Smith. Perfect. Thank you. All right. The next matter before the board, the applicant is 684 Center Street, JP LLC, Prolific Cannabis. The, the proposed license premise is 684 Center Street, Jamaica Plain. The license type is a retail recreational cannabis dispensary license. The proposed hours of operation are 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., seven days a week. This is an equity applicant. The initial application was filed May 17, 2022. 
The filing with Inspectional Services was March 31st, 2022, and the community meeting was held July 19th, 2022. Before we begin with the presentation, I will ask Aaliyah to speak on behalf of the equity certification. Thank you, Jasmine. Our office was able to certify 684 Center Street JP LLC doing business as prolific cannabis as an equity applicant through the documentation submitted by the applicant. Eric Lawrence is the CEO and the 56% beneficial interest holder of prolific cannabis, exceeding the 51% ownership interest threshold set forth in the ordinance. Mr. Lawrence meets the following criteria. He's a person who has resided in an area of disproportionate impact as defined by the Cannabis Control Commission for at least five of the last 10 years. Mr. Lawrence submitted a copy of his driver's license, copies of financial documents, and which established that he has resided on Greenwood Street, Dorchester from 1990 through at least 2021. We use the geocoder address search tool used by the CCC to determine areas of disproportionate impact. And it confirms that the address provided by Mr. Lawrence is located in an area of disproportionate impact. Secondly, Mr. Lawrence is a person who has been certified by the CCC as economic empowerment or social equity and has been a resident of Boston for at least one of the last three years. Mr. Lawrence has been certified by the CCC as both an economic empowerment applicant in April 2018 and a social equity applicant in May 2020. As stated previously, Mr. Lawrence submitted documentation which establishes that he has resided in Dorchester from 1990 through at least 2021. Lastly, Mr. Lawrence is a person who is of Black, African American, Hispanic, Latino, or Asian descent. Mr. Lawrence self-identifies as Black and provided his driver's license and birth certificate. Are there any questions about the certification? All right, thank you. Thank you, Leah. Um, who is present on behalf of the licensee? Eric Lawrence and Maya Gall. Thank you. Hi. You will have 10 minutes. You may share your screen and begin. Great. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the board. Uh, again, my name is Eric Lawrence. I'm the CEO of Prolific Cannabis. We're here today to present our proposal for an adult use recreational cannabis dispensary to be located at 684 Center Street in Jamaica Plain, Massachusetts. Prolific Cannabis mission is to operate a sustainable premium retail establishment that makes a positive impact on the community and those individuals that have been affected negatively by cannabis prohibition. Our leadership team consists of myself. I bring 20 years of uh, big box retail experience to this uh, proposal, which I hope to uh, put to full use. Maya Goal is our vice president, Tram Vu is our compliance director, and Chris Futo is our security director. We've also assembled a business support team that will help us in minimizing uh, a learning curve and onboarding our operations. Um, these uh, individuals are veterans in the cannabis space and uh, bring experience in operations, financial advisement, security, and compliance. Location is 684 Center Street again. It is approximately 4,500 square feet. Um, the location does not have any buffer zone conflicts. It's commercially zoned. It's in a business district. There are no direct residential abutters, no schools, social services, or treatment centers that are within 500 feet. We did have a traffic study conducted by Russell O'Neill, and that study revealed that there is ample parking during peak hours. Um, on the street, as well as a municipal lot that holds uh, in excess of 100 spaces directly across the street from the site. The site is accessible via MBTA and the bus. Uh, we will implement a pre-ordering system to limit the demand on parking and help with customer flow. There's six spaces for employees to park in the rear of our building. We will subsidize employee T passes to encourage uh, public transportation through the MBTA PERC program. There's a bike, uh, blue bike station directly across the street from the site. We have agreed with the JPNC to increase the size of an existing bike rack that's in front of the building that holds two bikes to a rack that will hold between eight and 10 as space would allow. This is a closer look at our site. 
Um, this is a former 7-Eleven and Dunkin' Donuts site, so it was a heavy traffic location. Uh, we don't intend to have any more traffic than they did, and I will let uh, Matthew speak to the uh, traffic results later. Um, this location has been dormant for two and a half years, and our intent is to um, activate the space and add to the business community of JP. Uh, this is our site plan. Um, the front location of our store is a 25 foot uh, uh, window space that we have. And we have um, been in talks with uh, both the JP Main Street South and the JPNC. Um, and we have agreed to cut out approximately 300 feet of the front of our store to allow for flex space where community meetings can be held. Um, an art gallery can be, uh, can be utilized for an art gallery as well as small business pop-ups that don't otherwise have a brick and mortar space. So when you enter our space um, from our entrance, your ID will be checked at that point. You could actually enter the flex space right to the left before entering the dispensary. Uh, upon enter entering the dispensary, your ID will be scanned and checked. You'll have an opportunity to enter our space, ample space of 4,500 square feet to have inside queuing, browsing of our displays. And at the point of sale, your ID would be checked again for a third time. Our back of the house consists of a limited access vault and a fulfillment area, as well as an employee break room, management offices, and a dedicated uh, receiving dock. Next slide, please. Our goals with diversity and inclusion, the first goal is to hire divert work, diverse workforce that includes those that have been negatively impacted by cannabis prohibition, as well as the identified groups that are listed here. Goal number two is to uh, build an inclusive culture through training, developing, and uh, mentoring our associates to prepare them for career advancement opportunities within our network of stores or the uh, cannabis industry as a whole. Our third goal for diversity is to develop a diverse supply chain and have a minimum of 20% of our products come from the identified groups. Programs that we will implement to ensure that we are reaching our goals under hiring, we will offer living wage jobs starting at $20 an hour, full benefits, we'll offer ongoing training for career development for our associates, we'll offer flex scheduling, as well as a housing grant. Um, under, under our goal number two, which is training, we'll simply implement a system which will each one of our upper management um, and leadership positions will be responsible for teaching. So it's an each one teach one system where they'll be required to provide four hours of training a month and document that information to uh, develop and mentor associates. And the third program under supply is what we will use our state li licensing tracker to identify those companies that fall within the identified group so we can engage with supply agreements. We'll, we'll measure the goals under hiring by charting and reporting our hires in the specific categories. And for our training, next slide please, we will also document our, um, we will also document and acknowledge associate promotions and career, career advancements. Um, same thing with supply, it's just to uh, measurements will be done through tracking and recording. Those that we engage with uh, that are EE and SE. Next slide, please. Great. So we will be offering living wage jobs for the aforementioned groups we've identified. We define living wage starting at 20 to $22 an hour. We'll have um, time-based and performance-based uh, wage increases. We also have full benefits, and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the affordable housing initiative. So uh, we want our employees to be able to live in the neighborhood that they work in. So we're offering two $5,000 grants that our employees put towards rentals or first-time home ownership. This is a breakdown of our employment plan. We'll have 30 uh, full-time equivalent associates uh, split between these positions. This is our um, specific diversity hiring plan. So our hiring goals will um, take on these numbers after we apply that. These are em our employment and community partners in the 
nonprofit partners. So throughout the licensing process, community feedback and positive impact have been very important for us. So we obtained over 200 letters of support from Jamaica Plain residents, workers, and budding businesses. Uh, our presence in the community uh, is to pro will provide a positive impact by increasing area security and also providing additional patronage to neighboring businesses. We also will be hosting expungement clinics at our location and will also join and continue uh, working with various community and neighborhood groups so we can yeah, provide and obtain feedback. So the CCC has strict regulations for security. All of our employees are required to pass state and background checks as well as, re as, well as train and register as marijuana agents. We'll continue to focus um, strongly on our compliance with security measures. Um, there'll be robust interior exterior security solutions. Um, we'll have duress alarms and be tied into B Boston Police Department. And we work with specialized firms to make sure that all of this can happen. So as Eric mentioned, we'll have three uh, step ID check for to make sure everyone is 21 plus. We retain the rights to deny sales to any individual. So anyone who diverts uh, product will immediately be banned and reported to law enforcement. Uh, we'll have randomized and discreet delivery of product to our store and we will only uh, participate in state approved marketing initiatives. Our nuisance prevention uh, plan will require all of our customers that visit our facility to comply with our nuisance prevention policy, which will include no public consumption, no diversion, lottering, or littering will be tolerated. Uh, security will monitor the sidewalk uh, in front of our building um, to ensure that no nuisance behaviors are happening. We will also have an inside queuing area with 4,500 square feet, plenty of space for people to wait inside, so lines will not form outside. Our pre-order uh, system will also help with minimizing the demand on parking, as well as helping with customer flow. We will not permit uh, double parking to be allowed in front of our location. That concludes our presentation. I'd like to thank you for your time and consideration, and we are happy to answer any questions you might have. All right, thank you. We will begin with questions and comments from the commissioners, starting with Chair Andres. Thank you. Um, there's no, um, let me just, I'm just double check, and there's no buffer zone issue here, right? No. Okay. Um, can you tell me a little bit about just the, the public process you guys went through with this location? Um, sure. Um, we, we've literally met with um, just about every organization in um, Jamaica Plain. We started with the Sumner Hill um, organization, and they had an actual in-person meeting, the one uh, organization that we had an in-person meeting with. That was our first meeting. We met with um, Jamaica Plain Center South Main Street on two occasions. Um, and they voted to support us. We also met with JP Pond Association. They gave us a letter of non-opposition with a 10 to one vote. We also met with um, the JPNC. They uh, voted to support us 10 to one. And we also met with JP Open Studios and J Jamaica Plain Art Association as well. Uh, we also, um, during the uh, city's um, open streets, we, uh, were, we, we set up a table outside of our location to get um, resident feedback, uh, people from the community. We were able to engage and have conversation, let them know what our intentions were in terms of opening, uh, what our plans were in connecting and impacting the community positively. We gained a lot of feedback through that um, experience, as well as a lot of support. Thank you. Um, I was just double checking the um, correspondence folder, but um, I think I am looking at the right stuff. So thank you. I don't have any questions at this point. Commissioner Holmes, do you have any questions? No, ma'am, not at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Lagos. Yeah, I just had one question about the, well, maybe two, the housing grant. Can you just walk me through that one more time? So it's two $5,000 grants and how are you thinking about criteria for 
given that you will have like 30 plus employees, what's the, how, what's your thinking about how that's going to get play out? Sure. Well, it'd be, it will be based on need. Um, and we will evaluate the applications that come in and, you know, we'll do them semi-annually. So first six months uh, out of the year. Uh, so anybody, obviously they would have to provide a lease agreement or a purchase and sales agreement that showed that they were required to uh, put down a certain amount of money um, or uh, for closing costs or for a uh, first time home buyer uh, agreement. So, um, you know, it, it will be on a, like a, a need basis, but we also will obviously do it as an, as, uh, as the opportunities arise or as the need arises. Um, so what, what, once we do cap those two first, um, we, we would love to in double that grant for the next year. We it's a, we'll, we'll use it as a pilot program initially, and if it's, it's been successful when we get a lot of response and we feel that we are benefiting our associates and, and helping them maintain residence in JP, um, we will be happy to, uh, to double that going forward and be able to help service more and help more of our associates. Great. And um, I was just trying to see, I'm sorry, I'm on my phone, so I wasn't able to see your presentation. And I know we have it somewhere on our in our files, but I'm going off of the memo. Can you remind me again how many employees you're, um, you said about 30, but I think when I was trying to do the numbers based on your presentation, was it was it 25 and 10? So 25 full-time, 10 uh, part-time, or did I have that wrong? I'm sorry, I can't really see very well. No, no, you're correct. That That's exactly uh, what it was, Commissioner, yes. Okay, so it's up to, it, so it is 35, not just 30. But it's 30 full-time equivalent, right, with uh, 20, 25 full-time and 10 part-time. Got it, okay, uh, yeah. thank you. Appreciate it, I'll take a look at the file. I just was um, confused no on the, on no the um, presentation. Well, Commissioner Smith. Thank you, Jasmine. And following Commissioner Lombos, I was also looking at the 30, 30 associates, 25 FTE and 10 part-time. So thanks for explaining that. One question about the wages. So you have three months, 5% performance review, six months, an additional 5%. And after 12 months, five to 10%. So you're capping that and that's in the first year. And then what happens after that? It's based on performance, uh, number one, Commissioner Smith. Um, and then as, in subsequent years, it um, for those employees, once they reach a certain, it'll be like an annual review. It's an annual review. Yeah, you think, yes. you're, you're thinking also of incentivizing that in terms of percentage? Um, yeah, well, we, we're, we're at 5%, but that could change. It could, it could go up to 10%. Uh, we will be flexible with that based on um, the associate, their performance, their commitment to uh, the success of our business. Okay. Any um, other kind of training or I see the grants are okay, but yeah, training, training is um, going to be a key component to our culture, um, as mentioned in the diversity and inclusion. Uh, we want training to be a constant throughout um, from, uh, you know, through the interview process, orientation, um, the review process, and thus the, the each one teach one. We will require our leadership team to take an associate under their belt and spend a um, designated number of hours with them, training them. Um, you know, it, it, our goal here was, is to get people in and to develop their career and allow them some upward mobility within um, the stores that we may have on board or any of the vertical operations that we may get into, as well as our vendors will have a connection with our vendors. So as jobs become available, if somebody's not interested in retail and they think that their interest lies in manufacturing or cultivating, we wanna be able to have a pipeline where we can um, source available opportunities and place our, employment, our employees in. So you're thinking at some point adding like um, other operations to it? Uh, we would operations. like to, we would potentially like to add other operations to our, um, to our company. To training your workforce for all of that. Yeah. Right. And in the meantime, right, since we don't have the operations, as we partner with vendors that are product manufacturers and cultivators, 
Uh, we want to be able to, you know, if, if somebody has an interest in getting into that industry or into those verticals, we would love to be able to um, provide them with uh, good associates so that they can continue their, their career aspirations outside of retail. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Commissioner Sankian. Thank you, Jasmine. Um, thank you, Eric and Maya, for the, for the presentation. Uh, I just had a couple questions for the security. Is the first point of um, ID, the first point of entry, is that a security guard that's checking the ID? Do you have security on site, I guess, is, is my question. Yeah, there will be on-site security um, that we will have on site. Um, we were actually in conversations with um, First Alpha Security to help us with the staffing of our security. Um, uh, but we also do believe that we want to be able to, in our, our each one teach one system, we want security to be able to cross train maybe bud tenders so that we have some flexibility um, in the IG, ID check system. Um, so if uh, needed, we can pull a bud tender off of a POS station and have them fulfill uh, the ID criteria, providing that they're adequately trained to do so. But you, you have on, on site security. Yes. Always. Okay. Um, can you explain a little bit about the takeout? You mentioned a 15 minute um, takeout parking. I know there's a sort of a temp, uh, 10 minute or 15 minute parking already in that exact site for um, deliveries, I believe it is, um, to, to non cannabis businesses. But what, what did you mean by your, by having a takeout space? Um, well, I, it's an option for us to work with the city of Boston. It is, as in most of these business districts are, that have multiple businesses that are serving the community that are short-term visits, whether um, one of the things we notice is that Grubhub and, and Uber Eats are very popular. There are several restaurants within this business district, as well as, um, you know, there's banking, there's... Um, uh, all sorts of businesses that you know people basically go in for 15 minutes and they come out and they've they've, they've satisfied their needs. So I think if we work with the city of Boston and we're able to implement a, a short-term parking, um, it would serve all all of the businesses within the uh, within the area so that we can mitigate the double parking issue. So it's not necessarily someone who who ordered online it could be somebody who would just go in and take less than 15 minutes and come out. Correct, yeah, it wouldn't be dedicated to, to our store. It would service the whole business community. Ah, okay, okay. It would be over and above, um, you know, the what the parking study showed, which is their ample parking on the street, as well as in the municipal lot across the street. Okay, I think I, I missed that part, thank you. Yeah, no um, And then, as, so as you mentioned, the double parking can, can oftentimes be an issue in, in that area. Um, are you offering delivery as an option to your customers? Not, not at this time. We're, you know, we're focused right now on the retail business. Um, it's something that we will consider um, going forward, but um, it is totally a different business. It's another business. Um, you know, a lot of the feedback that we are hearing from operators and uh, you know, one of the things that we will consider doing, I'll tell you, is consider um, contracting potentially with a um, SCME to, 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 to provide delivery service if we feel that uh, the need is there and if it helps and doesn't um, uh, add to any traffic issues, right. um, it's something that we could implement. Okay, yeah, no, that that's what I was thinking in terms of sometimes it can add to to traffic issues, but right. Um, okay, that's all I had. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Do any other commissioners have any follow up questions at this time? Seeing no one, we will move to public testimony, beginning with elected officials or their representatives. Hi, good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board. This is Tiffany Caballero here from the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services. This application has undergone an extensive committee process while managing to gain support of the civic and neighborhood groups, um, such as the Center and South Street Main Streets Association, as well as the JPNC Public Service Committee, both of which have written letters of support to this proposal. 
To date, I have nine letters of support from abutters and other businesses who believe that prolific cannabis will be a positive social impact, um, while I also have two in opposition. At this time, the mayor's office would like to go on record and defer to the board's judgment. Thank you. Thank you, Tiffany. I see my Kel has his hand raised. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Michael McMillan. I'm the Director of Constituent Services for Boston City Council, Kendra Lohr. Um, she is in support, and I just want to read a letter that she had wrote in support of prolific cannabis. <clears throat> dear Madam, dear Madam Chair and members of the Boston Cannabis Board, I write to offer this letter of support to 684 Center Street, JP LLC, and a proposal of an open, of an open and adult use cannabis dispensary. Uh, at 684 Center Street, Jamaica Plain, 02130, Ward 19, 684 Center Street, JP, LLC, has demonstrated an exemplary commitment to the Austin community where they have first, um, where they have their first approval, approved location. They have used their space to give back to the Austin Brighton community throughout the uh, through arts, exhibitions, and other community building events. 684 Center Street, JP LLC plans to use the same business model as they used in Austin to connect with the Jamaica Plain community. 684 Center Street, JP LLC is a model for being a good business neighbor. In addition, 684 Center Street has received overwhelmingly positive, uh, positive feedback from the community, including residents and neighbor, uh, neighboring businesses. As a city councilor for District 6, it is my job to ensure that businesses that contribute to the economic empowerment of our community are being uplifted. We are proud to offer our full support to 684 Center Street uh, as the proponents for an adult use cannabis dispensary at 684 Jamaica Plain in solidarity. Kendra Laura, thank you all. Thank you. Are there any other elected officials or other representatives that would like to speak? Seeing no one, we will move to those who have signed up to chat. Allison. You're muted. Sorry, is Mr. Trey Williams available? He just left a uh, note in the chat, Allison, that uh, you, you could probably read it. He's in a meeting, but he. Okay. Support. Yeah. Thank you. How about Nicole Gunn? I'm here. Okay, Ms. Gunn, would you like to proceed? I would, thank you. I would like to speak in support of Prolific um, because they have done such a good job in presenting to the community. I'm personally a board member of the Jamaica Plain Center, South Main Street. And um, I had a business in the district as well. And they've done a great job presenting for those of us that don't really have too much knowledge on cannabis, but have now made us pretty knowledgeable of it. And they've also done a good job in integrating into the neighborhood and showing up at community events, which then gives uh, space for an ongoing conversation of how they will then further integrate into the community. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Ms. Gunn. Is Alex Marie Mercado available? Yes, I'm here. Um, I'm Alex Marie Santos Mercado. I live at 11 Creighton Street, Jamaica Plain, Mass, 02130. Um, and I am full support of the prolific project um, as they will be generating more jobs for our JP residents and other local residents as well. Okay, thank you. Is James Finney available? Yes, I am, I'm here. Please I'm in support of, uh, can you hear me? I can. Okay, yes, I'm in support of this, this, this location, um, this business. Um, I used to work at 1200 Center Street um, for 20 years. And this area is an area that I used to go in to have lunch. So this area is a pretty diverse location. And I think that this business will do great in this area. And Eric and his team will support the location and do a great job helping the area and the neighbors in this location. So thank you. Thank you. Is Dennis Roach available? How about Naj Harrell? I see Dennis Roach on. I'm sorry, Naj. I see Dennis Roach on trying to unmute himself. 
Oh, I'm sorry, I can't. I'm trying to look at two things at once. I couldn't see him. Dennis, do you, do you know how to unmute? I can't hear you. There you go. Yes, sir. Hello. Hi, this is Dennis Roach. I live at number six, New Bern Street in Jamaica Plain, uh, which is about 46 blocks away from uh, the proposed Center Street uh, location for the dispensary. And uh, I guess uh, Eric approached me as uh, sort of a, uh, uh, a testimonial to uh, to the benefits of the uh, of the products that I have. Um, I'm 71 years old. Uh, I've been smoking since I was 16 years old. I never smoked tobacco. I had a test X-ray two months ago, and my lungs are clear. Um, cannabis is non non toxic. There's tobacco and alcohol are both poisons. So I'm for, I am very much in support of uh, the very nice folks opening the dispensary here in Jamaica. I think it would be very nice. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Roach. Um, Naj Harrell. Hi. Um... I am a resident of um, 10 Severns Avenue in Jamaica Plain, right around the corner um, from the location. Um, used to very frequently visit the old 7-Eleven and Dunkin' Donuts. Um, and I just wanted to voice um, as a resident of the neighborhood and a current cannabis professional, um, very excited for this dispensary um, to come into the neighborhood um, and in full support um, of prolific coming to the neighborhood. Thank you. Um, is Michael Rieskind? Right. I'm sorry if I'm saying that wrong. Um, my, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. get rid of that. Okay, my name is Michael Rieskind. I live at 425 South Huntington Avenue in Jamaica Plain. I'm a member of the Jamaica Plain Neighborhood Council. Uh, the Neighborhood Council uh, would like to vote to, uh, has voted to vote to support this uh, proposal at 684 Center Street. Uh, on a preliminary basis, we do uh, uh, understand they still have to go through zoning and we do have a zoning committee uh, where we will go into uh, greater depth uh, on, the, uh, on the issues. But uh, right now we're in full support um, we think this is a good fit for the neighborhood. Um, it's right in the middle of a busy, it's right at a very busy intersection in the middle of our business district. So the most important things uh, that have come up were traffic and not creating a dead window space. So it's important, I think, that they add uh, to the bicycle racks uh, on the front uh, of their building. And uh, most importantly, uh, use the front window space uh, so that people uh, can enter, so that it energizes the street. I think this flex space idea of an art gallery, pop up uh, a business uh, space, and community room is, is a good idea and is uh, will really enliven uh, the street. They did also uh, go to the Jamaica Plain Business and Professional Association. Jamaica Pond Association, Sumner Hill Association, a uh, group that is uh, reforming um, uh, the uh, 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 and JP Center South Main Streets, all of whom uh, are in support. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Is Mr. Daryl Weathers available? Yes, I'm available. Hello, thank you everyone for having me here. Um, I'm in full support of Prolific. Um, I'm a part storefront owner at uh, Scope HQ on 484B Center Street. And um, I think that the level of community engagement and ensuring the community with housing and, op and job opportunity is amazing. Um, it's, a, it's our, our economy and, and way that Boston is looking right now, we seem like a dying needs. And I think this is a power move for the community. So um, full support, thank you. Okay, thank you. And with that, that concludes all of the people who signed up online in advance of the meeting. Thank you, Allison. Um, Dale has his hand raised. 
Hi, uh, my name is Dale Kamravach, uh, owner of Jamaica Personal Trainers, uh, located here at Two Porter Street uh, in Jamaica Plain. I'm also a resident of Jamaica Plain for several years. Uh, I've been at a few different meetings in which Eric and his team have uh, come to uh, seek out uh, feedback from the community. They've taken a lot of our concerns uh, into consideration and have actually made adjustments, things like uh, looking to do something with the storefront, um, uh, concerns with just being, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a friendly neighbor, a friendly business neighbor to the other existing businesses. Uh, I'm in full support of this project. Um, I think that not only are they helping to, uh, you know, change up some of the, the diversity of businesses in the area, uh, they are taking over a business that has been vacant for, I, I think, maybe almost three years now. Uh, and they're bringing jobs, they're bringing jobs into the area. And at that, uh, ideally jobs with wages that can help afford the prices to be in Boston and other parts, uh, or I should say JP and other parts of Boston. So uh, again, I'm in full support of it. I wish them the best of luck. And I think what they're doing now, consistently reaching out to the community for more engagement is the way to do it. And I encourage them to keep doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Or is there anyone else that would like to speak in regards to this proposal? Seeing no additional hands, the board will take this matter under advisement. Um, so those were all the matters before the board today. The board's voting meeting will take place next Wednesday, August 17th at 1 p.m. The information to access the voting hammer will be posted on our website boston.gov backslash cannabis. Again, the record will be kept open until next Tuesday, August 16th at 5 p.m. Thank you all for attending and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you.